the video on it even looks better. Oh, great. I lost audio again. One second. Let's see. Hopefully this will fix it once I start sharing my screen and pull up the PowerPoint. Um, can you hear us? All right. Hopefully this works. Can someone confirm that they can hear me? I can hear you. Yes. How annoying. I swear. What is going on? Probably when you record. Still no one can hear me? Be sure. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, I can see Vance can hear me. And now for some reason I can't hear you again. But well, it is what it is. Which brings me to my first announcement. As of next week, like I said, I'm going to say it again all of this week to make sure everybody gets it. As of next week, for attendance, if you're online, the attendance words will no longer suffice. You'll still need to do the questions. Because after the, the last video I looked at, I could tell when you guys, when I couldn't hear you, I don't know. I guess you just forgot that it was getting recorded. But obviously, some people aren't paying attention. And, uh, you know, the whole point is to pay attention. So... Again, starting next week, no matter what, you're either in person or you have to do the questions. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're online live like you are right now, I want to reward that. So if I could fix these audio issues, I'll do things like ask questions and you can get extra credit for attempting to, to answer them or, um, you know, extra credit, uh, even more extra credit for answering them correctly. Or even just a little bit of extra credit for just being there live online, because if you wake up and you're there at 8 a.m., as opposed to somebody else who just watched the video, you know, I think you should be rewarded for that. So again, next week, attendance will be the questions. And I will still do attendance words because I'm going to, not because you need to email me to them, but because I'm going to incorporate those into the questions as I, as I already have. So that's that situation. I would ask you guys online if you have any questions, but I can't hear you. Do you guys in person have any question about attendance? All right. So it's pretty much the same. Worst case scenario, you forget and you show up online and then you send me an email saying what the, what the words are. Then I'll write you an email back and say, oh, that's a great job. Here's a little bit of extra credit for doing that. But don't forget, you need to do uh, you need to do the actual questions to get credit. Moving on exams. I'm sure you guys have seen the announcement. The exam will be Friday. Obviously, it's not today. Um, it'll be just like all the other ones. It should be about 50 points. Or excuse me. 50 questions. It's going to cover an even amount of the last three chapters, which was chapters eight, chapters nine, chapter 10. Um, you can, I'm going to schedule it to start at eight, which means it'll probably start a little bit earlier. As soon as it pops up, you can start it. You can start it as early as you want. Just make sure you have it done by 8.50 a.m. Because if it is late, you will lose 10 minutes per point that it is late. Because I have to ensure, you know, with 50 minutes, you don't have enough time to look every question up. That's the reason why we do this. Of course, I did say in the announcements, if you want to take a longer version, you can contact me and take one in person, but it's too late for that. We needed to already make arrangements. So tomorrow is the day for you, except the one person who's taking it today. Um, so yeah, that's it for, oh yeah. And then the study review, you know, I don't know. I'm going to try to find a, a time to do it either today or tomorrow. I'm going to post it, but there's already been a study review recorded. I've already shared that with you. So for this study review or this exam review, I'm only going to answer your questions. So I'm not going to go in and answer every single question on the study guide. So come prepared. If you have questions, let me know. If I post the date and time and say, all right, this is when I'm going to do it and you can't make it, but you do have specific questions, just send them my way. You don't even have to like type them out. Just say chapter eight study guide, number 17, number 25 and number 30. Chapter nine study guide, number seven, chapter 10 study guide, you know, and just list the ones you want me to cover. That way, if you're not there, I'll go through your email and I will list the ones that you need help with, even if you're not there. Any questions about that? All right, good. Let's jump into it. We are in my favorite section. The last section of this biology course is my favorite section. Because up until now, everything we've covered is what happens inside you or what happens inside of an organism, right? You learn about how cells work and how heredity works, and photosynthesis, and respiration, mitosis, meiosis, all that stuff. Finally, we're getting to the stuff that I love, which is not how stuff works inside of you, but how do organisms work in the world? How do organisms interact with each other? How do species interact with each other? How do ecosystems um, interact with the world? And to start that, we're going to talk about populations. Uh, excuse me. 
well, we will be talking about populations. Um, and that's a good hint, actually. We're going to be talking about uh, evolution, specifically how populations evolve. So here we go. Let's jump into it. Because we are a little bit behind, I'm not going to do the little guessing game, but I will mention this. Um, the top left, that's supposed to, you know, hopefully you can see that's a picture of a tomato. Most likely that's like a cherry tomato they bought at Kroger. But what that represents is the way tomatoes used to look. So tomatoes, before humans got a hold of them, looked like that. But then we did something called artificial selection, right? And we grow, we bred them to be bigger and juicier and tastier. And that is, again, what we call artificial selection. Artificial selection is a type of evolution. Um, this kid right here, he looks like he's going crazy. If I remember correctly, that is a picture of a kid and he has headlights. And I think, if I remember correctly, what your book is getting at there is um, what we're doing, what's happening slowly but surely with head lice is we are slowly forcing evolution with head lice because, you know, people get head lice, we put the medicine on them, it generally kills them. But occasionally there's one that has something inside of them, some sort of genetic mutation, which is the last thing we talked about in the last chapter, right? And that genetic mutation allows those lice to survive the basically the pesticides that were put in their hair. So the ones that survive, those are the ones that are immune to this pesticides. And those are the ones that go on to survive and reproduce. So slowly but surely, what we're doing is we are creating a super breed of head lice and also any other kind of pest you can imagine. Because as we kill them and as those that survive the killing, you know, those are the strong ones. That's evolution. That's natural selection. Um, these cheetahs, you're going to learn in this chapter that cheetahs uh, went through two bottleneck events. Bottlenecks are situations in where you almost lose the entire population. Um, and because of that, you have very little bit, uh, very little um, genetic diversity. And we'll talk about that in the context of population. So I would ask if you have questions, but again, that's just the introduction. And we're a little bit behind, so let's move forward. You can see this chapter has a lot of main bullet. Whoops. This chapter has a lot of main bullet points. Um, most of them that we've been doing have three, four, sometimes five. This one has many, many more, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's an involved, it's an involved chapter. But in my opinion, a lot of this makes sense, right? A lot of everything we learned prior to this does not necessarily make sense because you cannot see cellular processes happening. What we're about to learn now for the rest of the semester when we're talking about how things happen in the real world, hopefully it's a little bit easier because you can see it happening. Before we even get into natural selection and evolution and all that and how things change, let's talk about the diversity of life because diversity came from evolution. So let's get into it. Taxonomy, you need to know what that is. Taxonomy is the branch of biology that's involved in identifying, naming, and classifying species. So for example, we have Dr. Runke in Hamblin Hall. Um, actually, he's got, you know, he, his office is right next to mine. And that's what he does. He does taxonomy. That's a subcategory of taxonomy that I won't have time to get into. But basically, he finds new species of tapeworms um, that he finds in sharks and shark-related fish. So anyway, yeah, that's what taxonomy is. Any questions about what taxonomy is? Pretty simple, right? And if anything, there's only going to be one question where I say, hey, what's taxonomy? So simple concept, very few points involved. This brings us to something called the Linnaean system. You guys are probably familiar with the Linnaean system and don't even know it. Like, for example, you know, some species, you're actually used to saying the species names, like Tyrannosaurus rex, right? That's, a, that's an actual species name. Homo sapien, that's a species name as opposed to human, right? Human's the, the common name, but the actual species name is Homo sapien. But anyway, the Linnaean system, it's a method of naming species. It's a hierarchical classification of species in the broader groups of organisms. So, for, again, Homo sapiens, right? That's us. That's humans. That's our species. Homo is the genus. So we are a part of a genus Homo. Now, granted, I think, uh, excuse me, every other member of our genus is extinct. But then you get broader and broader, right? Yes, we fall into that category, but we also fall under the primate category. And then if you get even more broader, then if you get more broad, we're all mammals, right? And if you get even more broad, we're all vertebrates. And if you get even more broad, we're all animals. And then if you get even more broad, we are all eukaryotes. You don't need to write any of that down. I'm going to give you those examples later. The point here is the Linnaean system is how we name species, um, and it gets broader and broader, or more specific, depending on how you look at it. Um, 
I'm gonna try to find. There is a good video that I've shared before. I want to find it again and share it with you about the Linnaean system. Because before that, you can things were really confusing um, before things uh, before the Linnaean system was adopted. Anyway, are there any questions about taxonomy or the Linnaean system? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the Linnaean system. So, nope. All right. Let's talk about the Linnaean system, naming and classifying the diversity of life. The Linnaean system. In this system, the species is given a two-part name, like I've already mentioned. So for the example I used was Tyrannosaurus rex, two parts. Homo sapien, two parts, right? And it's a Latinized name. I could give you some good examples. Hopefully I can find some. So sometimes people like Dr. Run Grunke, for example, will find a new species and name it after somebody. And then they'll just make it sound Latinized, right? They'll just do something to make it sound Latin. Anyway, that two-part name is called a binomial. I'm not necessarily going to ask you what a binomial is, but if I use that word, now you'll know what I mean. The first part of that two-part name is the genus, which is, a, if you want to know what a genus is, it's a group of closely related species. Your book uses the example of Panthera. That is a genus of large cats. And you do need to know that. There will be a test question where I give you a, a species name. Um, you know, again, like Homo sapiens. And then I might say, what genus, of course, I won't use Homo sapiens. I'm just using this as an example. Uh, and the question might say, what genus is this species in? And then you'll be like, oh, yeah, well, the first part is the genus. So Homo would be the example. And then it'll get a little bit more complicated. I'll tell you Homo sapiens is in the family this. And then I'll ask you what order is it in. But we'll come to that when we get there. So for now, you just need to know. Um, it's a two-part name, two-part Latinized name. First part is the genus, second part is the species. Any questions so far? I see people taking notes, so I'm going to try to slow down. You might notice I'm going quick, but that's because we are short on time and I'm trying to hurry things up. All right, and for those of you online or in person, um, if you don't mind, go ahead and just send me an email after class and let me know that you're here essentially on time. I know some of you came in late, but I won't, I won't mark you for being late. For those of you online, um, the first word for attendance today is surgery. You know, like when you go under the knife because you're trying to get a hernia fixed or trying to remove a tumor or something like that. Anyway, the first part's the genus. The second part is the species. You put the two together, that's a species name. And your book keeps using the same example. So the scientific name for a leopard is Panthera partis. So again, Panthera, that's the genus name. Artis, that's the actual species within the genus. Some of you who have written about species in independent work already know this because I've corrected you, even though you didn't lose points for it. But the first part, well, first of all, the whole thing's in italics, right? And the second part is the genus name is always capitalized and the um, species name, the second part is not. So you need to know that too. Though, to be honest, I probably won't even ask you about that. That's not crucial for understanding the rest of this biology course. So you might be confused, or not confused, but you might be wondering why. Why do we even call a leopard Panthera partis? Why not just call it a leopard, right? Why do we have to make things more complicated? Well, first of all, it's biology, and we like to make things complicated. No, not really. But let's talk about why. Does anybody know what that is? And forget the, uh, the actual scientific name that I have written there. It is a fish, yeah. Does anybody know what kind of fish? Is that a it's bass? A oh, I can hear somebody. What? Is that bass? No. This question does a lot better where I'm from. Uh, I'm from Florida. People know this in Florida. Sorry. So I guess no one knows what that is, huh? You've probably seen it on the menu, just have never seen what it looks like. Salmon. Is it no. tilapia? No, that's okay. Wait, I love oh, hold on, hold on. One more guess. One more guess. Good guess. guesses. This is uh, on the menu what you would call mahi mahi. So mahi mahi is actually the name that you would see that it, that name originated, I think, in the uh, Polynesian islands like Hawaii, that area, where I'm from. When I was a kid, that was called dolphin, and it actually used to say dolphin on the menu, but that used to piss off or scare the tourists or whatever. So eventually, they adopted the Hawaiian name because people were like, oh my god, you guys are eating flipper. So, yeah. Anyway, mahi-mahi is what they call it um, now. 
pretty much everywhere on menus. But and again, in Hawaii, that's where that originated. Or like I said, dolphin is what we called it. Dorado is the Spanish name. You guys might, some of you might recognize that. Shira, that's the Japanese name. The point here is, this is why we have these complicated scientific names, because this one species of fish, depending on where in the world you go, is called all these different things. So if you're a scientist trying to communicate with other scientists, it helps to know exactly which species you're talking about. Of course, this is just an example. I'm not going to ask you any questions about the mahi-mahi on the exam, which, by the way, this would be on the final exam, not the exam you're taking on Friday. Anyway, are there any questions about that? Again, my only point here is that you have to have scientific names because there's different names for species all over the world because we all have different languages. All right, here's where it gets a little bit more complicated, or not necessarily complicated, just more stuff to remember. Linnaeus, which is where is the guy, the scientist, where we got the name Linnaean, the Linnaean system from, he introduced a system of grouping species into a hierarchy of categories. What do I mean by hierarchy of categories? I mean it gets either broader, 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 or more, or more um, specific, depending on which way you go. For example, I drive a, uh, an F-150 XLT, right? That's very specific. And then I could get a little bit more broad and say, I drive an F-150. Or I could get a little bit more broad and say, I drive an, uh, a Ford. Or I could get a little bit more broad and say, I drive uh, an American-made automobile, right? Or I get even more broad and say, I drive an automobile. That's hierarchy, right? It gets more broad or more specific, depending on which way you go. So the way I'm introducing it here is we are going to get more broad. Oh, that's not working, is it? Man. So the, so the sound works now, and now I guess my price to pay for that is I can't draw on this anymore. Let me back up. Let me try one thing here and see if this works. No, that would be too easy. Anyway, obviously species is the most specific. So a bunch of species that are closely related would be a genus, right? And a bunch of genuses, well, I said that wrong, the genera, that's plural, um, that are similar, they're in the same family, right? And a bunch of the same family are in order, and then you get more broad and you get classes, and then you get more broad and you get phyla, and then you get more broad and get kingdoms, and then finally you get domains. So you do need to know that order, and that might be the hardest part of this exam, is just memorizing those in order. So if we're going more broad to more specific, it would go domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, genus, species. And the next slide I'm going to show you shows you that. So I'm not going to ask you if you have any questions yet, because the next slide is basically this slide. But visually, there we go. Domain, eukarya. In this case, we're talking about this leopard. Or, yeah, the leopard, right? So the most broad we can get is eukarya, right? We are eukaryotes. We're not bacteria. We're not archaea. Eukaryotes. Um, and then within the eukaryotes, we're not fungi. or They're not fungi. They're not... Um, protists, they are animals. They're not plants, they're animals, right? And within the animal kingdom, there's a bunch of different types of animals, but specifically they are chordates. It's sort of like the, the, the ones with vertebrates. Within that, within all those vertebrates, you know, you've got, um, well, I wish I had more time to get into it. You get more specific, you get into mammals, more specific, carnivora, because not all mammals are carnivorous. And then you get into the cat family, and then the panthera, the large cat genus, and then, again, specifically, the leopard. This is just an example. I'm not going to ask you any questions about this particular animal. I will give you some species name. Um, and I might even say, it will be so, all right, let me give you an example. You might get a question that is listed like this, where it says, you know, Panthera partis. How am I going to put this? You know what, I'll just share it with you. I don't have time to talk about it right now. I'll share it with you. There's already a question on the study guide like this. So I'll just make sure I highlight that when the time comes. But are there any questions of what you need to know here? You need to know these in order, in any direction, whether you're going domain, animal, domain kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, or whether you're going species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain. You need to know those. And you need to know what you're doing. You need to know if you're getting more specific or less specific. So, no questions? Okay. Here's the same thing, same concept. Uh, it's a different picture. 
This one's not from your book. I like it better. I like it more though because this one has pictures, so you can see all the things that fall under the domain of eukarya, and all the things that fall under the domain of animals, and then all the things that fall on. I mean, kingdom of animals, and then the, the chordate phylum. You can see all the, some of the things that fall under there, and then some of the things that fall under subphylum, which we don't even talk about. But anyway, again, if you're studying, see, I wish I had a pen. I'd put a big X through this. This is a good example. But this is not from your textbook. Therefore, it has information you don't need to know. Like I said up there, subphylum. You don't have to worry about any of that. But what is going on here? Anyway, if there's no questions, we'll move forward. This is an interesting thing, something to consider. The criteria used to name and classify species is ultimately arbitrary. What I mean by that is there were humans that have decided, like, all right, we're going to say these things are together in a family. And we're going to say these families are together in this class, right? Somebody decided that. But after you learn about the process by which diversity of life has evolved, then we will introduce, or I will introduce, a classification system that is based on the understanding of evolutionary relationships. So, yes, it's arbitrary, but it's not like people were just doing it willy-nilly. It started off a little bit willy-nilly. It started off where people were like, well, look, all these flowers have three petals. So we're going to put this in the group together. And all these flowers have, I don't know, six petals. So we're going to put those in their own group. So, so there were some rules. They had some a method to their madness, but it was more arbitrary. And basically, I'll tell you this. As time goes on and as we get more tools, it becomes less and less arbitrary. Yes, we, there's people, there are humans making these decisions but we have things that we're basing these decisions off of. If you download the PowerPoint, you can click on this little video on that um, slide right there and watch a little video about taxonomy. I forget how short it is, but I recommend it. Any, point, uh, any questions about this slide? Nothing important here. This is more of an introduction, sort of the bridge between what you just learned and what you're about to learn. All right, let's explain the diversity of life. This is almost like a history lesson. So you can understand what we used to think as opposed to what we know now. The explanation of the origin of diversity of life is the evolutionary theory that was proposed by Dr. Charles Darwin. He proposed it in a book called On the Origins of Species by Means of Natural Selection. It was published in 1859. But your book points out, even though he came up with this, which is the prevailing theory right now, he was not the first person to try to explain things. Um, as far as the exam is concerned, this slide is not important. I'm not going to ask you anything. Uh, probably not going to ask you anything about Darwin. I'm definitely not going to ask you the name of his book or when it was published. But again, this slide is more of a segue into what we're about to talk about, which again is basically the history of our understanding of the diversity of life. And some of these, some of these things you will need to know, and I'll let you know which things you do. All right. First of all, let's talk about the idea of a sick, fixed species. Aristotle, for example, this dude right here, a fellow Greek guy, he said the species are fixed permanent forms and do not change over time. He wasn't the first big person to say that, but he was one of the more famous. Um, also, if you look at the Judeo-Christian culture, it reinforces this idea. If you take a literal interpretation of the book of Genesis, because it tells the story that each form of life being individually created in the present day form and not changing. And if you click that picture or the picture of the Holy Bible, there's some videos that kind of uh, kind of talks about the two things. That one obviously um, talks about Aristotle's ideas. And if you click on that one, it's a very abridged version of um, what a literal interpretation of Genesis would say about um, evolution. Me personally, and this is just me, so it doesn't matter what I think. I'm just giving you my opinion. I think that if you don't take this literally, then evolution makes sense. You can work it. You can work it in there if you don't take it literally. Anyway, are there any questions about this slide? If anything from this slide, you would need to know. I might ask you. Um, Aristotle and the Bible believed what? And basically, the answer is. Species are fixed. They don't change, right? All right. 
Moving forward. In the 1600s, religious scholars estimated that the earth was 1600, excuse me, 6,000 years old. So back then they thought it was 6,000 years old. Not based on science, but based off of reading different scripture. And they're unchanging, dominated for centuries. So for a while, that's what everyone thought. Even scientists. I don't even think scientists were looking into it at that point. That was just what was believed. Like, okay, the, the Earth is only 6,000 years old. Everything's fairly new. It's made just the way it was, and nothing's changing. Then a little bit later, naturalists started grappling with interpretations of fossils. So even though everybody at first believed that the Earth, Earth was only 6,000 years old, and all the animals here today have always been here and they've never changed and there was never anything as such a thing as extinction. They still, some people were finding fossils and that had to be confusing. How do we have, the, what, what is this? This makes no sense if the world's only 6,000 years old and nothing is changing. Um, your book really quickly in this portion of the chapter defines fossils and the definition they use is imprints or remains of organisms that lived in the past. But if you take notes, you don't necessarily need to write that down. Because we're going to discuss fossils later in this chapter when we talk about the evidence for evolution and the evidence of natural selection. Um, but since we're talking about that word right now, let's have that be the second word for attendance. Fossils. Any questions? All right. Let's talk about why they were puzzling. Fossils were thought to be the remains of living creatures. So, in other words, non-extinct creatures. But some of them were very puzzling. For example, these snake stones, that's what they call them. They all looked like this. Every single one looked like that. Every time they found one, they looked like that. And everybody just assumed those were snakes, right? Those were dead snakes. So then the question was, well, why is it that every time we find them, they don't have heads, right? And by the way, to remind you, refresh your memory, we just mentioned the two first steps of science, right? Observation. Yeah. All of them don't have heads, or none of them have heads. Question, why don't any of them have heads, right? Science. Anyway, because no one could answer this and no one could figure it out, some people started to hypothesize, hey, look, there's the next step, right? Some started to hypothesize that maybe these fossils represent species that have become extinct. Which again to us means like that's not even a big discussion. Like we know that. We've all seen Jurassic Park. We know about dinosaurs. Those are the most famous, I think, examples of extinct animals. But yeah, we know that uh, species go extinct. I mean, species have gone extinct in our lifetime. So we know what happens. They didn't. But that was the question. That's what they started wondering. That was the hypothesis, too. So anyway, discovers in the late eight, or excuse me, the early 1800s including fossils of a gigantic sea creature called the ichthyosaur, which loosely translates to fish lizard, convinced many people that extinctions had indeed occurred. I'm still giving you a history lesson here. There's no, no need to take notes. I'm not going to ask you any of this yet. So far, to refresh your memory, the only thing I might ask you so far um, is the fact that Aristotle, in a literal interpretation of the Bible, says that species are unchanging. Yeah, and no extinctions have occurred. So far, that's all you need to know for the exam. Anyway, if you download this PowerPoint and click that picture, there's a short video you can watch about the ichthyosaur. Are there any questions so far? All right. Here's a little of this next bullet point. It's going to have a little bit more information that you'll actually need to know for the exam because we're getting closer to actually understanding evolution as we know it today. We're going to talk about Lamarck and evolutionary adaptations. So, naturalists started to compare fossils with living species, right? They were looking at these fossils. Well, they didn't start to. I'm sure they've been doing that. So, they're still doing this. Naturalists, again, they're looking at these fossils. They've convinced themselves at this point that, okay, things have gone extinct. They've come to that, that realization. And now they're doing some comparisons. All right, this thing, this extinct animal, let's compare this fossil to this living animal, right? They're comparing the two. And they're like, all right, well, I see this. I see how this is a lot, this dead thing is a lot like this alive thing in these ways. But also, I can see how they're, they're critically different in these ways, all right? They're comparing and contrasting. They can tell they're different species, but they can tell they're related. And with all that came French, the French naturalist Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck back in the early 1800s. 
He suggested that the best explanation for the fact that these extinct animals are similar but different than the extinct ones is that they evolve, basically. Life evolves. So as far as we're concerned, Lamarck is the first person to suggest evolution. So you do need to know Lamarck's name for that reason. You don't need to know it was in the 1800s. You don't need to know the full name, Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. You don't even need to know that he was French or that he was a naturalist. Just know that Lamarck is pretty much the first person who said evolution happened. So on a timeline, as far as the exam is concerned, we've got Aristotle in the Bible, who says no evolution, nothing's changed, nothing's gone extinct. Then we've got Lamarck, who says, yeah, things, have, things must have evolved. That's the only way we can explain the similarities and differences between fossils and living creatures. We're going to talk a little bit more about Lamarck, but for now, are there any questions? Okay. I think if you download the PowerPoint and click the picture of him, there's a video. No, never mind. There's not. Scratch that. All right, let's talk about more, some more of his ideas. He proposed that evolution is a refinement of traits that equip an organism or organisms to perform successfully in their environments, which is a correct statement. That was a correct proposal. That is exactly how evolution works. It does refine traits so that organisms are a better fit for the environment. Here's where he got it wrong, though. He says that by using or not using body parts, an individual may develop certain traits passed on to the offspring. So that would be like, I don't know, if my brother worked out all the time, upper body, and he had like really big pecs, really big biceps, really big deltoids, just stacked. And then he had kids, his kids would come out slightly, slightly more endowed on the upper body because that's what he did. Right? That's what he used. That's literally what Lamarck thought would happen. Well, of course, he didn't. wasn't talking about bodybuilding. He actually did give some specific examples in nature, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But for now, just know that, that that's the main concept. And you do need to know that for the exam. Know this bullet point. Not only was Lamarck the first person to say evolution explains the diversity of life, right? the first person to propose evolution, but he also wrongly assumed the way it happened was if you use it, you, know, you pass it along. So his idea, like I'm kind of getting at here, his idea of how species evolved was mistaken, right? So the second bullet point was his idea of how species evolved. That was incorrect. His proposal that species evolve as a result of their interactions between organisms and the environment, that part was correct. And that did set the stage for Darwin. So Darwin didn't like come in and figure everything out. Lamarck had already suggested that evolution happens. Lamarck had already said that it was a way to help organisms adapt to their environment. So he was on the right track. Any questions so far? All right, you guys are pretty easy, no questions. That brings us obviously to Darwin. Oh wait, so I didn't say it. Okay, your book must talk about it and I didn't include it on the PowerPoint. Let me back up very quickly and give you a real life example of Lamarck. Lamarck thought that giraffes had long necks because you know, they probably started off a long time ago, just a, no a normal creature with a normal neck, but they're in the savanna. You know, they're trying to re they eat leaves from trees, so they're reaching, right? They're reaching, trying to get the leaves. And he thought, you know, as they keep doing that their whole lives, it it's going to make it a little bit longer. And then, therefore, their offspring are going to come out a little bit longer. And then their offspring are going to come out a little bit longer. So he thought that's how giraffes got long necks. That was a good example of one of his famous ideas, right? Giraffes got long necks because they, they were stretching and they were using them, right? But that's not how it happened. And that brings us to Darwin. All right, here's some information you don't need to know for the exam, but it's a good introduction, so let's talk about it. Charles Darwin, he was born in 1809, on the same day as Abraham Lincoln. They've got the same exact birthday. He was very fascinated with nature as a boy. Um, he went to medical school, partially, I would assume, because he was uh, interested in science in general. Um, but medical school back then was a little bit different, right? Because they didn't have surgery the way they do now. They didn't have anesthesia. Things were disgusting. Uh, surgery was horrifying. So he couldn't stomach it, basically. So he quit medical school. And this is where it gets interesting to me, even though I'm not going to ask you about it on the exam. When he left, uh, when he quit medical school, he studied to be a clergyman. 
Because when you think about it back then, like, well, even today still, evolution, or excuse me, natural selection and evolution, actually, very often butts head with religion, right? But here you have a man who was schooled in religion. So it's not like he was just had some complete disregard and hatred towards religion. He didn't. But anyway, um, at the age of 22, he began a voyage on a boat, a ship called the HMS Beagle that helped frame his theory for evolution. There's a picture of the Beagle. It went around the world. He went around the world. He saw a lot of stuff, and uh, we're about to talk about some of that stuff he talked about. Yes, if you download this PowerPoint and click that picture of the HMS Beagle, which is actually a Lego version of the HMS Beagle, um, you can see a quick little uh, YouTube video about um, his upbringing, him, his uh, formative years. Anyway, let's talk about his journey, his actual journey, not his life journey, that trip around the world that I was talking about. The Beagle was a survey ship. It was charting um, south, um, uh, excuse me, this is a little bit incorrect. It was a survey ship, meaning it was making maps, but it was making them around the world. But where he's most famous for, or some of the more influential information he got was from South America. So that's why that's listed. Anyway, you know, this is back in the day, right? So when they went on shore, it's not like he hit up the bars or went to a restaurant and got a good cheeseburger, right? Things were different back then. There was nothing to do, not much to do. So he spent his time on shore exploring, right? This makes sense. This is the stuff that fascinated him as a kid. He was collecting fossils and not only fossils, but he was also collecting live species. What you had to think of, uh, think about this. Back in the day, that had been very fascinating. Now, you know, you can go to Kroger and buy a plant that's native to Australia or go to Lowe's and buy a plant that's native to, I don't know, Japan, right? It's easy for us to get plants. Plus, then we, if we go to a zoo, we can see plants and animals from all over the place. But back then, that wasn't so easy. So this was like, this was amazing for him and for most people at the time. Anyway, not only did he do that, but he kept detailed journals of his observations. It's not like he was like Instagramming or TikToking, like, hey, this is me with this fossil in South America, right? He couldn't do that, so he kept detailed journals instead. Actually, that would be an interesting movie to do like Darwin in, in New Times. So he's not like taking detailed journals, he's taking selfies with a bunch of stuff. It's me and Obama. Anyway, he would take detailed journals that way. As he's doing this, he's noting characteristics of plants and animals that made them well suited to diverse environments. Because he went all over the world, so he saw diverse environments. He saw marine environments. He saw uh, tropical rainforests. He saw, you know, uh, deserts. Right. He saw a lot of diverse environments, and he saw a lot of diverse animals and plants living in those environments. And he took note of it. When I say he went around the world, this is what I mean. This is where he went. Not that you need to know any of this. Obviously, he started in England, went down to South America, went around, uh, went to the Galapagos, which is very important. We'll talk about that later. Went around the world, because the world, guess what? It's not flat. Put that out there. Went around Australia, South of Africa, so on and so forth. What's interesting to me, this is another side note. Does anybody know where Darwin, Australia is? It's up here, right where he did not go. So I don't know how that happened. But anyway, that was his trip. Their position to South America, position to South America is actually very important. And we'll talk about why here shortly. And that's them zoomed in. Um, I'll probably come back to this picture after I give you some more information. But when we say the Galapagos Islands, I'm sure you've heard those words before. That's what we're talking about. You can see there's a, quite a few of them. There's some really big ones, some really, really small ones, some of them that aren't even named. Right. Uh, some of them are farther away than others. Some of them are very close together. All that will be important later. Let's talk about his observations. We already briefly said that he was observing things. He was observing living plants and animals and fossils, and he was paying attention to what they looked like in all these diverse environments. But let's talk a little bit deeper about it. His observations indicated this is an important bullet point right here. That geographic proximity is a better predictor of relationships among organisms than similarity of environment. And that's complicated. That's a little bit wordy. 
But I want to make sure you understand that. When he's looking at how all these animals and plants were different, like from one place to another, and all these different environments, what he noticed that more, what was more important wasn't like if they were similar, like if he was talking about the really dry island off the coast of, you know, one of the dried Galapagos Islands versus a similar island off the coast of Australia, right? Very similar islands, but the organisms were much different. But he also noticed that those organisms on the Galapagos Islands were very similar to the organisms that were on the mainland of South Africa, or excuse me, uh, South America, that had completely different environments. So again, what he's saying here is that it doesn't matter that they had different environments. What was more important than the environments was the fact that these were closer in proximity, like geographically closer. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand that? Because again, he saw all these different environments all over the world. That's what he came to realize. That it's all about how close you are geographically. So for example, Washington in the Pacific Northwest, the western side of it is very rainy, right? Because you get all that moisture coming in from the Pacific. It can't make it over those mountains. So basically it just dumps all the water right there. That's why it's so rainy in Seattle. But on the other side of the mountains, it's very dry. Because again, that moisture doesn't make it over the mountains. It dumps it. So it's very dry. It's almost like a de desert. But the animals and plants are going to be very similar. Well, relatively similar in Washington versus, um, I don't know, the dry part of Washington versus the dry part of Greece, right? So they might be similar environments, but they're really far apart from each other. I want to make sure everybody understands that. It's very important. So any questions? All right. So the South American fossils that he found were clearly examples of species that were different from living ones, right? So you could tell by looking at them, like, okay, these things are definitely extinct. These things definitely don't exist anymore. But he could tell that they were also very similar to the things that are alive. For example, does anyone want to guess what that is? And yes, it's a bird. So this will get a little bit more specific. Okay. Yeah, a toucan, right? That would be my guess too. Anybody want to guess what this thing is? Might maybe llama, alpaca, right? Um, how about this? I know most people don't know that one. Not this one. Right? Yeah, yeah. And see which one are you even pointing at? Bark. What is it? Which one are you pointing at? Well, none of them anymore. I was pointing at the capybara, but point is, Schmidt guessed a lot. Matter of fact, when you email me, I want to give you some extra credit. So remind me that you guessed a lot of them. Point is though, that these are actually artist renditions of animals that don't exist anymore. So to us, that does look like a toucan and an alpaca and a capybara, and an iguana. And they're very closely related, but they are different, right? And of course, we can't tell in this picture, but when he was looking at the fossils, he could say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is definitely a toucan-like animal, but this is definitely not a toucan. And again, I know we can't tell that with the pictures, but he could with the fossils. And again, that's a big, that's a big piece of information back then, right? He's, he can look and say, these things that are no longer with us, these extinct animals, clearly are related to these alive ones and of course these are all in south america so you could tell again that geographic proximity anyway any questions so far all right obviously darwin would be intrigued by the distribution of organisms on the galapagos islands well everywhere but specifically on the galapagos islands why the galapagos islands we could devote a whole day to talk about this, but I won't. So I'm going to give you the cliff notes and hopefully find a good video that will really explain it in detail. But first of all, the, uh, the Galapagos were relatively young volcanic islands. That's the first thing you need to know. They were relatively young, meaning South America has been around longer than the Galapagos Islands, meaning the things that are living on South America couldn't go to the Galapagos Islands at first because the Galapagos Islands didn't exist until relatively recently. But then, boom, boom, we had some volcanoes. That's how islands are built. And then once that happened, then organisms start could start going over from mainland South America to the Galapagos. But here's another thing that's interesting. It's about 540 miles away. So from South America mainland to the Galapagos Islands is about 540 miles. I'm not going to test you on that. But here's what you need to think about. That's pretty far away, 
right? So most creatures, including a lot of birds, maybe even most, I don't know if I want to say most because I'm not an ornithologist, but most things are not going to be able to make it from South America to the Galapagos Islands. So imagine this brand new island, nothing living on it, right? Because it's brand new. The volcano just formed it. But eventually, every once in a while, maybe there's a good storm that blows off South America, right? And blows a bird or some birds over. Um, maybe some stuff like some palm fronds land in the ocean off the coast of South America and some things attached to it. Maybe some certain fish or iguanas or some reptiles, whatever. And it's far enough away where most things are not going to make that trip. Does that make sense? Like most things are going to die trying to get 540 miles or just completely miss the island, right? That's pretty far off. And most likely they would just float off into the middle of the Pacific and just be done and dead. But every once in a while, something would make it. And that's very, that's very, that's a very important thing. Because essentially what I'm saying here is the Galapagos Islands were close enough to where they could be populated from animals and plants, creatures from South America, but they were far enough away to where it wasn't happening regularly. Meaning the things that made it, made it to the Galapagos Islands for the most part were kind of in their own little world, right? They were not being influenced by the other creatures in South America. Yes, that's where they came from, but they were far enough away that that was not happening in a lot happening a lot anyway um that being said he did notice too speaking of the galapagos islands that most animals that were found on the galapagos were found nowhere else in the world right so he found even though he'd been all over the world he found species there that he found nowhere else they were unique to the galapagos islands and despite the fact that they were completely unique they still resembled they were clearly different but they still resembled south american species um, the next word for attendance is going to be, let's just go with South America. Why not? Here's some examples. And these are just examples. You know, I'm not going to test you on this. He noticed that the Galapagos marine iguanas had a flat tails that aid in swimming. Most iguanas didn't have such a flat tail. Like all the other iguanas he uh, encountered in his life. They were similar to, but distinct from, the land-dwelling iguanas on the South American mainland. So again, like I said, probably thousands of times, at least thousands of times, some iguana fell on some palm frond off the coast of South America and died, you know, floated out to the Pacific and died. But probably on a handful of occasions, maybe a pregnant iguana, not pregnant, an iguana that had some eggs, you know, made it, survived the trip and made it from South America to the Galapagos Island and started a new life. And then that iguana, just doing its thing in its own environment, which is completely different from the environment from which it came from, and therefore that population is going to change in one direction, completely different from the population it came from in South America. We'll talk more specifically about that later. Um, he also noticed that each island had its own distinct variety of giant tortoise. Notice too, let me remind you, let me point this out, that iguanas were the same on all the islands. Which makes sense. They're marine iguanas. They can just swim from island to island. The tortoises, these big old things, they can't exactly just up and move, right? So he noticed that each island had its own distinct tortoise, and that makes sense because they would evolve in their own direction, right? It's not like they could go from island to island and interbreed, and that'll, that'll be more important a little bit later. If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch that little video of marine iguanas. Um, you can watch that little video of the tortoises. What I think about the Mm, it, he could also tell based on the shell what island they're from. Like dome shells are from one island, saddleback shells are from another. Those are just examples you don't need to know about. Really quickly, another thing you don't know, need to know about, but I find interesting. Does anybody know who Steve Irwin is or was? You guys heard of him, the crocodile guy? Anyway, he had a pet tortoise, and that pet tortoise was from the Galapagos Islands, and that pet tortoise was owned by Darwin. That was Darwin's tortoise, and I don't even remember how um, – he got to it, how Steve Irwin got it. But that just goes to show you how long those things lived. They lived to be hundreds of years old. Anyway, those were his observations. And again, if we're talking about the scientific process, you know what comes after that? Well, after observations, you have questions. In this case, insights. So while he was on his voyage, again, he was bored, right? He didn't have iPhones, didn't have anything to do. So he was reading a lot. He was strongly influenced by a book called Principles of Geology by a guy named Charles Lyell. You don't need to know that for the exam. If you want, you can click on his name and watch a little video about him. What this book basically said 
was that the earth is ancient. It's not 3,000 or 6,000 years old, like everybody, like the religious people were trying to say at the time, right? He says it's ancient. He said that the earth has been sculpted over millions of years by gradual ecological processes that still continue today. So that's a book that he read while he was on his journey, and that influenced him. He's like, yeah, that makes sense. And then not only was he reading it in his books, but as he's traveling, he's seeing this in action, right? For example, there was a point where he experienced an earthquake. I think it was off the coast of South America. I don't remember for sure. But in that one earthquake, he saw that a rock, a portion of the, the coast, changed like a meter, right? About three feet. So he saw in one instance, right, a few seconds, the land changed three feet. So he knew if that could happen in a matter of seconds, that surely over millions of years, there would be large, like substantial ge uh, geological changes. So because of all this and everything else he'd witnessed, he began to doubt that Earth and all of its organisms had been created just a few thousand years earlier, right? So this is planting the seed of doubt in his mind. This is where this idea came up of, Wait a minute. Maybe the Earth is long, long, um, older than 6,000 years old. Um, so basically, when he got back to England, that wasn't the end of the story. That's when he just finally reflected on all that stuff. He looked at all of his specimens. He looked at all of his journal entries. He looked at all of his fossils. He thought about everything he had witnessed. And it basically, he basically marinated on it for a while. Right? He discussed that work with his colleagues. Um, yeah, and that's where we'll end it. I guess, the, to the last word for attendance will be insights. So I will be online on Friday for the exam. You don't have to be. The exam will be online, but you don't need to log on like you are right now for those of you online. I will be there if you have questions. Don't miss the exam. If something goes wrong and you think you're going to be late, I don't know, maybe contact me so we can figure out a time to do it later in the day. Because if you are late, if you, do it, if you turn it in past 8.50 a.m., you're going to lose 10 points per minute. If you, if you turn it in five minutes late, you're getting a 50%, even if you score 100% correct, right? So don't be late. Any questions? All right. Keep an eye on your email, um, and I'll post some times when we're going to do the review. And now I can do. Have a good day. All right, you too.